You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back. It is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central. It is 2.30 p.m. Eastern. It is time once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, a program where we do it all. We break down all the action out there on the other side of the fence, maybe where you don't watch day to day, but have grown more compelling to you given all the headlines of late going to talk probably some energy maybe some ag some metals some rates some equities you never know it's going to sneak in there today i got a feeling i'm going to talk a little bit of crypto <laughs> and a whole bunch more my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as of course from the ever exciting network upon which so many of you are just mainlining these days hey we don't judge Keep it up. Yeah, it costs us an arm and a leg and bandwidth, but we love you all out there. <laughs> and of course, if you are enjoying the on-demand, I should say, then keep rating and reviewing. It does help the new folks continue to flock in and keep driving our bandwidth costs up. It's a good problem to have. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to join us live for this show, for everything else that we do throughout the week, and you want to get some awesome exclusive shows that the on-demand folks just can't get. Then you got to head over to theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club. This week we have the creator of VolQ himself, Mr. Scott Nations, also author of one or two or about half a dozen financial tomes, including a new one coming out, answer some great questions about volatility and skew and all these things that are top of mind for a lot of people right now. You can check out a clip of that for yourself if you want over there on our Twitter. Just go to at options. It should be pinned up there. And of course, the link is there to explain how you can listen to that and all the other 40-odd ones that we've done, plus all the oddities, plus participate in future ones over there at the Slash Secret Club. Just don't tell anybody. It's a bit of a secret. And, of course, however you listen, live after the fact, we don't judge. If you listen after the fact, keep sending in those questions. We do love to hear from all of you folks out there. And let's get on out to what we're talking about today. I will be joined 
a little bit later in the show. But one of our favorite guests, Mr. Tim McCourt, the managing director over there at CME. We like him because he's the head of equities and he's the head of crypto over there. Usually when he joins us, he's got some hot new products burning a hole in his pocket that he wants to talk about. So I'm looking forward to that in a little bit. But now let us commence this show the way we are want to do. It is time for the Movers and Shakers Report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show we break down everything that's lighting it up to the upside, a.k.a. the light side, and to the dark side this week at CME Group. And I love when I get to do this segment by myself because then I get to choose. Nobody gets to tell us where we have to start our journey. I get to choose light side or dark side. And you know me, listeners, you've been listening to this show for a while, you know I like myself a good bit of dark side, even though it's like... Light side is outnumbering the dark side ever so slightly this week. If you want to see this chart for yourselves, of course, if you give a follow to CME on the old Twitters, or if you follow us on Twitter, we do tweet it out right before showtime as well. So you could see it for yourself. This is one of the few charts you talk about here on the show that you can't access over there on the slash Twifle link at CME. You have to be a premium user of Bantix to get access to that, which, by the way, if you like these markets and you're trading a lot, using a lot of this data, you really probably should consider it. Their tagline is very apt. All the stuff you can't find all in one place. It is completely true when it comes to all of the futures options data. Let's go around the horn now. Let's start to the dark side. Number five to the dark side. We've got good old SRW wheat. You know, the ags have been on the rampage, taking a bit of a break this week off 1.32%. Number four, we got the 10 year off 1.37%. So from ags, we go out to rates. And then we're hanging out in rates again, the ultra 10 year with off 2.05% this week. Then we head on over to FX. Uh, The yen USD, don't see that too often, two and three quarters percent to the dark side. And number one, again, one of our stalwarts, our frequent offenders. This is one of the three names you could guess any given week, and chances are they are lighting it up to the light side or to the dark side. This week, it is lumber dominating the dark side off 14 and two-thirds percent. It was number two in the same direction last week, off 13.61%. So lumber crashing down pretty hard out there right now. Now to the light side we go. And there's probably another name I mentioned before. There's three names you could usually guess, and you usually have a good chance of being right. One of them is lumber. The other one is nat gas, and another one is Bitcoin. Any one of those three, you toss them out any given week, and you have a pretty decent chance one of them is leading the charge to the light side or the dark side that week. And this week, NatGas, one of our frequent offenders, is actually outside of the top five. You know, it's a pretty aggressive week to the upside when NatGas is up 3.35%, and it's only at number eight, listeners. Didn't even make the top five. What is in our top five? Well, number five is good old Arbob with 4.96%, so hanging out in the energy sector this week. Then number four, going out to crypto, our old friend Bitcoin, so one of our other three frequent offenders at number four, 5.48% to the good this week. The exact same spot last week as well. It was number four, up 3.68%. So the light side, a little bit less aggressive. Uh, Last week, number three, you probably can guess this was going to be somewhere in there. This week, it's WTI, number three. So back to energy, 9.26% to the upside. Number two, still hanging out in energy. It's Brent, up 11.45%. And number one, also energy, energy kind of trifecta here at the end. In fact, four of the top five are energy this week in the light side listeners. It is a heating oil blowing the doors off up 18.66%. It was number three in the same direction last week, up 3.83%. So I think you know, listeners, where we have to begin our journey this week. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody. Let us commence our journey this week. You know where to go. Seemegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O, or slash TWIO, T-W-I-O. Both of those should work. Case sensitive, I should point out. So if you throw any caps in there. Going to break the whole thing. That'll get you to our This Week in Futures Options reports. From there, just go into that asset class drop down, select energy, and then pop it over to WTI. That is where we are beginning our journey this week. Listen, I would talk heating oil, but 
not a huge options story. Maybe we could swing by a little bit later, but we have to start where so many people are fixated right now. You know, the price of oil dominating the headlines, everything that it translates to the price of gas, of course, all that leading to increasing inflation and the cost of shipping and logistics, everything going up across the board. So this is very much top of mind for a lot of people. I saw recently right before showtime, I think it was Ice T trending on Twitter that he got robbed. And everyone was like, oh no, what happened? And it turns out he was joking about the gas pump. He was robbed at the gas pump. So even Ice T out there making jokes about the price of oil and indeed gas right now. That's the level we're at right now. Coming into showtime listeners, 113 and about a quarter in WTI. So not only are we still north of the 100 handle, but we are well north, up another 10.12 points just since Monday's session. That's almost 10%, 9.82%. So WTI actually even up even more just this week than, than it was since our last show. Only up about nine and a quarter percent from last week. But from the start of this week, from this week in, that's where our reports begin from the Monday session. 9.82%. So a lot of upside here. And how much paper is lighting it up? You probably would expect it to be a pretty active week, and you would not be mistaken. Half a million contracts almost exactly. That's a pretty active week. Usually we see around 400,000, but it's also not the 1 million contracts we saw not too long ago. So things are obviously active out there, but not exploding the way they were a few weeks ago, which again makes sense. Once we flirted with these levels a few times, the second and third time you get up there, it's a little bit less of a shock to the system, right? So the volume perhaps not as aggressive. Let's see where that action is actually hanging out this week. Let's see, about 31% of it going up in the May contract that has 21 days to go. So we shall hang our hats out there as well. The vol, if you're wondering, you know, crude has been whipping around, so probably not going to see vol coming off. And that's pretty much exactly what we've seen. We've seen vol ticking up a little bit this week. So maintaining that level and actually adding a bit. It was at about almost a 77 exactly in that May contract. That's up three and a half points from where it was this time last week. Let's get out to the skew, because that's always interesting in a product like WTI. Last week, the puts were cheap, 3.2% cheap. This week, they are even cheaper, 7.8% cheap. So puts coming in pretty hard. Nobody wants to touch them, which is interesting. Usually, when you rally up the skew like this, you see the puts swing a little bit on that axis and actually get a little bit bid. But when you get aggressive moves like this, all bets are off. Uh, Last week, the calls were bid, 7.2% rich. This week, even more bid, 9.4% rich. That one probably in line. We're blasting through strikes to the upside. Kind of hard for those calls to come in. And in terms of the most active contract out here this week, you know, it was a little bit surprisingly spread out. I'm seeing it looks like it was the 120s, which again, that sounds like just an outlandish strike listeners. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago on the show. We were talking about can WTI maintain a bid over 40? Can it keep up these lofty levels? It's Around 45. Can it stay up here? Now we're at the threatening 120. <laughs> Just the, such a paradigm shift in the energy markets right now. But yeah, we're looking at the 120 calls. They've actually done a total of 10,000 this week, 10,143. Pretty active all week long. 3,000 today, 3,400 yesterday, 3,000 on Monday, and about 800 on Tuesday or so. So it's kind of back and forth all week long, opening, opening, a little bit closing on Tuesday. But it seems like predominantly opening paper on the 120 strike, which would go to also reinforce this increased bid we're seeing to the upside. Remember, when you, if you gently move up the skew curve, you should expect those calls to actually come in. But as you shoot up the skew curve, they can maintain their bid and actually they get more bid as we're, as we're seeing this week as folks are scrambling, looks like, to open new positions on the 120 strike. I mean, think about that. It sounds so rich, but again, that is... Close to where we are, a little less than less than seven handles now, about six dollars and seventy nine cents away from the one twenty strike. Right behind that level, listeners, we have the eighty five put. So it wasn't all calls all the time. In fact, we have a cool poll about this a little bit. We talked about last week. We have the results for you coming up a little bit later in the show. We asked you about your end of year options picks for WTI, and the results may surprise you. They certainly surprised me. Uh, eighty five puts pretty active this week as well. 9,436 on the tape. This one is a little bit different. Unlike the 120s, which have traded, looks like pretty actively all week. Pretty much all the 85 puts went up on Tuesday. 7,200 of the 9,436 went up on Tuesday. Pretty much all of that opening, 1,000 on Wednesday and a couple hundred on Monday and today. So this is pretty much one big print on Tuesday of the 85 puts. And again, we saw those puts get cheaper. So maybe some opening sales on that 85 strike, some folks coming in and deciding 
between now and May expiration, we're not getting back down to 85. So we're going to harvest a little bit of the old risk premium. That would certainly account for why those puts are not only catching a bid, but getting annihilated. Someone, someone is hitting some bids on the put wing this week. Let's look really quickly. I also saw the 130 calls so of 120s aren't optimistic enough for you. 130 is doing about 9,200 contracts this week. So kind of neck and neck. 10,100 for the 120s, 9,400 for the 85s puts, and then 130 is doing 9,200 out here. The big day for them also yesterday, 4,500. Looks like bias towards closings. Maybe some folks thinking 130, a bit of a bridge too far, taking that off. Also saw 2,500 going up on Tuesday, or I should say Monday, slightly opening there, but looks like a lot of back and forth paper. In fact, a lot of back and forth paper, it seems like, on this strike throughout the week. Only about 1,000 going up today. Again, these are such outlandish strikes that I did not think we would be saying anytime soon, but that is where we find ourselves right now. So a little bit farther out, CBC, any more outlandish strikes going up. The 120s in June also traded about 9,000 times this week. So it seems like 120 is our strike of the week out here this week. Also traded 3,000 times in July, actually 4,000 times in July. But if that's not optimistic enough for your blood listeners, you want to go a little bit farther out. Don't you have to go all the way to December. You should have to go to December to see some more of the crazy upside. This time, you only have to go to September, where the 150s were trading pretty actively this week. About 5,000 times they went up this week. 2,000 yesterday, 2,000 today, and about 1,000 the rest of the week. Most of that opening. So opening on the 150s, listeners, which is very interesting out here. 150. I'm looking to see if there are any other legs it could have been spread against. Maybe some ratios of the 120s or the 200s, but it doesn't seem to line up pretty well with either of those. It seems like the 150s. Trading on their own listeners, opening up a substantial portion of OI. 150s in September, not even December, listeners. 150s in September. Think about that. Obviously, we don't know the direction on those, but think about what it would take to even threaten the 150 strike by September. Spoiler alert, it would not be good for the broad economy and pretty much for, for any of our lives, I don't think, for crude to be threatening the 150 strike by September. But hey, it's only 30 odd handles away now. So crazier things have happened. Before we welcome on our guest, let's cap off the energy segment as well with our old friend, the frequent offender. Again, it's number eight this week, but it's kind of it's kind of uh, energy across the board. It's a pick em of energy in the light side this week. Let's go out to Nat Gas really quickly as well. Nat Gas at about a 539 coming into showtime, up nearly 11% since Monday. So if you look at it from a just a weekly perspective, W Child, excuse me, Nat Gas would actually probably be in our top five this week instead of again 539 right now so the 540 strike is what we're looking at out there in that gas and of course it wants to be an equity right now because actually a lot of paper this week 520,000 contracts on the tape and of that about 25 percent almost exactly going up in the contract that goes away in a whopping four days the april contract so we're going to go a little bit farther out this is we're going to go to may that has 17 percent of the paper this week so a little bit less but also, more time to digest out here. The vol, if you're wondering, 59 and a quarter, up 7.12 points. And in terms of skew, we had the puts last week, 4.7% cheap. This week, getting cheaper, 7.5% cheap. So again, that's a discount to that at-the-money vol level we were just talking about, that 59 and a quarter, listeners. And if you want to buy a call, you got to pay a premium. That's 8.2% last week. That premium has actually come in a little bit. That's 6.9%. That's more along the lines of, what you would expect as you move up that skew curve there that those calls would come in. But we did move kind of aggressively, so you might you would be excused if you thought some people would be bidding up these calls, but that apparently not the case out there this week. Interesting stuff. And let's see, of that half a million contracts, let's see. Actually, it's interesting. Actually, Nat Gas trading a little bit more paper than WTI right now, which is kind of interesting. Uh, let's see. The six calls in April were leading the dance this week, listeners, with about 23, almost 24,000 contracts. That's a pretty active contract for Nat Gas listeners. And of that, the big day was Tuesday, 10,600 on Tuesday, slightly closing there. It seems like back and forth on Tuesday, 7,300 today, 5,200 on Wednesday, and about 300 on Monday. Not a lot going on on Monday. So the big day, clearly Tuesday out there. I'm pretty active today as well. It looks like a lot of back and forth on this six strike, which again, we're not, it's still pretty far away, but especially for a contract that goes out and <laughs> goes out in four days, <laughs> a lot of upside and living to do before you threaten that six strike right behind it. We have the five half calls going up 15,200 times. 
the most active day. Actually, today, 5,600 going up today, 4,000 yesterday, 3,000 on Tuesday, 2,000 on Monday. So kind of a nice <laughs> 5, 4, 3, 2 <laughs> all throughout the week there. Kind of back and forth every day this week. So it seems like a lot of opening and closing paper. Again, which is close to the at-the-money strike. So that's, that's to be expected. Let's look a little farther out, see if we can find anything else. Actually, let's go out now to the month where we were hanging our hat out there this week. It was the April contract that had, excuse me, the May contract. The four half puts were leading the tape out there with 11,685 of those going up. The big day again today, 5,257 going up today. 4,500 exactly yesterday, most of that opening. 1,600 on Tuesday, also slightly opening, and a couple hundred on Monday. So again, Yesterday and today, the big days for a lot of these Nat Gas contracts here. And a lot of opening paper on these four half puts. Interesting stuff. Six calls, four half puts. Which way are you leaning, listen? Maybe that might be a good question of the week out there as well. But interesting stuff. One of the other interesting narratives we've had for a while now in Nat Gas is how active these upside call strikes are going pretty far out. And that appears to be the case again this week. We were talking about the sevens a few weeks ago being active all the way out to October. Well, that is the case again right now. The sevens are trading six, almost 7,000 times in October again this week. Uh, six calls are pretty active in September and August and also July and indeed June. So from June all the way to mostly October, it's pretty much the six calls. You get to October at sevens again. You know, NatGas has that seasonality to it as well. So once you start getting into the fall, you might expect a little bit of a bid, but the fact that we're maintaining action on this six strike all the way through the typically weak seasonal period for Nat gas, which is the summer is indeed kind of interesting. If you want to go a little bit more aggressive, let's go out to February of next year. The 10 calls going up 2,100 times this week. Listeners uh, yesterday and today, both a thousand and change opening yesterday. Don't have today's numbers. So uh, interesting stuff. 10 calls opening throughout the week in February of next year. What, if we're trading out of 10 in the winter of next year, listeners, what does that mean for us from an energy perspective, from a society perspective? A lot to unpack there. Again, you guys can find all this for yourselves. Do a deep dive into all of this good stuff over there at cmegroup.com slash twife. I'm looking really quickly to see if we can find any other interesting you guys probably want to know about heating oil. Unfortunately, it's not a huge, a huge options product. But if you want to find that, go into that product family. And then we're going to stay in energy. We're going to get out of crude oil, though. We're going to go down a few to the refined products category and then select heating oil. And then once you get in there, you'll see why we don't really talk about it a ton. Even though it's doing, for heating oil numbers, it's doing a decent amount this week. 2,747 contracts have gone up. Again, not a ton, but for this name, that's actually pretty active. And if you're wondering, that's in the June contract where all that's going up. That future's at a 351. The front future going out in four days is at a 411. So that one's up quite a bit as well. We're going to hang our hat really quickly in this, in this June contract. The vol and heating oil, listeners, up 13 and a quarter points to 77 and a half this week. Skew, it looks like it's all calls all the time. At least it was last week. Six and a half percent bid last week. 2% bid this week on the calls. The puts are kind of negligible. 1.2% bid last week, and they're pretty much unched this week to the at the money. So no premium or discount there. And of most of that paper, I said 2,747. The lion's share of the trading was the June two half puts going up 850 times. Looks like we got a two half three put vertical going up 300 times by 425 yesterday and about 300 by 425 again today. So they did the same numbers both times. So a slight ratio total of 600 of the three puts and 850 of the two half puts. So Looks like opening actually on both. So that's not a roll. It's just an opening three, two half ratio put spread. So there you go, listeners. Everyone who wants to know what the leading offender to the light side is up to this week heating oil. <laughs> there you go. That's what we got here for everything over there in the land of energy. But you know what's happening now, listeners? It is time to turn our attention to some newer products because it is time. Talk about some crypto. It's time to explore the volatile world of Bitcoin, Ether, and more. It's time to talk about crypto. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crypto segment. Haven't had a chance to really sink our teeth into this one too much of late because we've been waiting 
for some new stuff to come down the pike. And I am very pleased to say we are now joined by our guest this week in the CME Group Hot Seat, our good friend over there, Mr. Tim McCourt, the Managing Director and Global Head of Equity Products over there at CME Group. He also moonlights in a little bit of crypto. Mr. Tim, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. It has been too long. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Tim, you know I like when you join us on the show because that usually means you've got some cool new products in your hot little hands, sir. Is that the case again this week? That is the case. Uh, come on, come Monday, we'll be introducing micro Bitcoin options and micro Ether options at CME, which we're very excited about. Well, yes, those are the options that a lot of people have been waiting for and our audience have been asking about. I mean, the big stuff is fun. The big stuff is fine for the institutions and for the ETFs to come in and issue their contracts and shares against. But for a lot of our audience, they're really intrigued by the micro stuff. It seems like it was forever ago that you launched micro Bitcoin, but it was it was less than a year ago, which it seems crazy now. And then, of course, the micro Ether. Far more recent than that, it was December 6th that I do recall, so only a few months ago for the micro ether futures. And now, Tim, you know, I've asked you this, I don't know how many times, when are we going to get the options? When are we going to get the options? You finally now are granting the wishes of our audience. So again, let's, let's break it down a little bit. Let's talk about the contracts, the specs. What can people expect from you guys coming soon on the micro crypto front, sir? Absolutely. And, you know, Mark, to your point, we launched micro Bitcoin. Uh, last year in May, and that's traded over 4.7 million contracts on the futures, which is amazing. And, and MicroEther launching in December, already trading over 1.2 million futures contracts. So, I mean, that's that's amazing when you think about it. Uh, and certainly really excited now for the uh, the micro crypto options to come online. And similar to the micro futures, it's one tenth of the token. So one tenth of one Bitcoin is one tenth of one Ether. These are options on futures. So they, the, the underlying is the micro Bitcoin and the micro Ether future. Uh, when we look at the expiration, the other thing I'm really excited about is unlike the, the BTC options that are out there, which are just the, the last Friday of the month that coincide with futures, here on the micro Bitcoin and micro Ether futures, we're going to have the, ne- the nearest Monday, Wednesday, and Friday contracts. So we have the, the weekly Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're also going to have four Friday contracts in the market at once, and then the two nearest uh, monthly contracts that line up with the the first two futures contracts. Uh, so that's exciting, you know, combining not only micros, but Mark, as you know, everyone loves short dated options. Uh, so combining two things that people love, or I guess three things that people love, crypto, short dated options, and micros, right? All wrapped up in one. Uh, the tick size on the micro Bitcoin will be $5 per Bitcoin. Uh, and on the ether, it'll be, you know, 50 cents per ether in terms of the, the tick size, just like the future. Uh, and they, they go live on Monday. So we're, we're super excited. Uh, I really hope that the, they're as successful as their future, uh, you know, uh, underlying and, and just really excited to get these out for the market. People have wanted them for a, a long time. Wow. Sounds like we're going to have an embarrassment of expiration soon, Tim. Almost a daily expiration going in uh, in crypto pretty soon, sir. Taking what you've learned in equities and applying it to the crypto, I see. That's right. You know, I mean, I think especially when we look at crypto, uh, it, it's people love to trade this market. Uh, they they are always interested in precision around their, their their trading strategies, and that was something we heard loud and clear from customers is that they wanted, you know, something a few days out. They wanted that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They wanted to try the trade the the Friday weekly options. Uh, They didn't want to just necessarily trade that monthly contract. Uh, So I think this will give them a a tremendous amount amount of flexibility when they're trying to deploy their strategies or do some spread trades. Uh, And, you know, it's sometimes you just got to give the crowd what they want. Well, the last time we chatted, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it actually was back on December 9th. It was right after the launch of the micro ether option. So it's actually been a little while since you and I have chatted. You know, I was excited for the micro ether, but I was, I have to admit, a little bit surprised at just how aggressively people really adopted these things. Those futures were, were doing a pretty decent ADV pretty quickly right after that December 6th launch. Were you surprised at that, Tim? Or you think maybe now that you've built up this ecosystem of crypto offerings over there at CME, people now kind of know what to look for, what to expect, and they're a little bit more, shall we say, quick to pull the trigger on some of the new products when you guys list them? I think that's right. So, I mean, to, to a certain extent, I wasn't surprised because, 
we had heard so much demand for the micro ether future contract. But, but you know, to an extent, the fact that it's now doing 21,000 contracts a day here in 2022 and also has its own, you know, an open interest of almost 40,000 contracts, uh, that, that's tremendous. You know, micro Bitcoin is also trading about 21,000 contracts. So I think, Mark, your intuition is correct where now that this is the micro ether was the fourth crypto future at CME, people are quicker to adopt. They're already in micro Bitcoin or the bigger Bitcoin or ETH contracts. So it's just an easier step for them to trade micro ether. Uh, and they, they got right into it, you know, now trading you know, 20,000, 21,000 contracts a day, which is great to see. Yeah, we certainly see this as well from our, our crypto program. There is just this strong audience of people. They really like themselves some ether. It's number two from a market cap perspective, but it's number one in the hearts I know of a lot of the audience. So maybe in retrospect, not quite as surprising to see so many people embracing the micro ether, but still always interesting to see. And this has to be, Tim, to my recollection, the fastest turnaround we've ever seen. December 6th, you launched the futures on micro ether and we're getting the options on what, March 28th. That's, that's certainly, I mean, how long did I have to bug you just to get Bitcoin options? A couple of years, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you're making my job easier here, Tim. Yeah. I like it. That's right. You know, a co- couple of years and a, co- a couple of conferences mixed in there, uh, you know, to get, to get the Bitcoin options. But, you know, it really comes down to, to client demand. Uh, and, there, you know, I've said on other shows too, Mark, there, there's no magic number uh, that we wait for before we introduce options on, on futures. We just want to make sure the futures market has its own, uh, you know, it comes into its own right, so to speak, in terms of liquidity provision, ability to absorb uh, the risk transfer and, and the price discovery process. So there needs to be a, an element of robustness in the future before we overlie options on those futures. Uh, and might agree that it got there pretty quick. Uh, you know, you, you know it when you know it. And, it, 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 you know, even though we, we didn't publicly announce that we knew MicroEther was going was to be on the fast follow, given the success of the futures. Uh, and also with micro Bitcoin, you know, the feedback we've gotten is just making it that smaller size, more more right size contract at one tenth of the token. It makes it easier to trade for folks. It lines up with what some people are doing on some of the overseas platforms or the unregulated platforms. So we're also interested now of just bringing that style of trading to CME where the people love to trade crypto futures. Uh, and now we're, we're hoping they're going to love to trade the micro crypto options as well. Well, you mentioned the conference scene. I myself did not go down to FIA Boca this year. It's one of the first years outside of the pandemic start that I really haven't gone. I know for a fact you were down there, Mr. Tim. I saw you quoted in a few articles because it seems like all the talk this year was about crypto down at the FIA. It seems like you were the bell of the ball, Tim. Was that surprising to you that everyone and their mother at FIA wanted to talk crypto? You must have been the, the go-to guy in demand, Tim. Yeah, you know, crypto is certainly a topic at Boca, like it is everywhere. People, people can't get enough of crypto. Uh, you know, they also, down at Boca, you know, it was not just crypto. Uh, everyone also wanted to talk about my, my other favorite products, micro e-minis, and those are doing well. It's all sorts of great things coming out of CME. Uh, you know, we, we recently announced that we're going to be introducing event contracts in the third quarter of this year, you know, right before Boca. So we had lots of great things to talk about. Uh, crypto is always exciting, uh, but, you know, Plenty, plenty of good old-fashioned futures talk as well down at FIA. Uh, we'll get to the equity stuff in a second. Before we dial out of uh, all things crypto, I'm just looking at the numbers right now. One of the ongoing discussions you and I have been having for a while, ever since I, I finally forced you single-handedly to launch the Bitcoin options, is like, you know, when are they going to start ticking up in volume? We saw a decent decent volume so far this week, 436. Again, doesn't sound like a lot, listeners, but for this product, it's actually a pretty decent amount. Remember, that's a 5x multiplier. Everyone's really been waiting for a more bite-sized contract. It seems like this is the product they have been waiting for. We should see more more interest in that on March 28th. But I'm curious for you, Tim, do you expect a little bit of overlap? You know, whenever you have one hit product, it usually tends to drive some volume in another. Do you think if we get a, an aggressive uptake on these micros that that will translate into some more paper in the original mothership options on Bitcoin as well? I do. You know, I mean, it's tough to say what, what the knock-on effect will be, but I think if we can get market participants to start with the micro-sized contract, I think that'll naturally uh, generate more interest in its older sibling, the 5X options on futures for BTC. Uh, I still think those are great and right size for institutions. And, you know, so, you know some, some retail traders and active traders may, may, may find that size attractive because it lines up with the, the big BTC future. Uh, but I would expect if we can get some some paper going in the micro size contract that you're gonna you're gonna get some risk off lays into the bigger contracts. You may get people spreading between the two. Uh, so it'll be interesting to watch the development. Uh, tough to say, you know, the crystal ball is, isn't working so well today. 
Uh, but I am hopeful that the success will transfer to the big contract as well. All right, you've been twisting my arm, Tim. So let's get there now. It is time to explore some equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody. Welcome to the equities section. When Tim's not busy talking about crypto, he also moonlights a little bit over there in the equities. You folks know where to go to find the equities. See me group.com slash twifo. Get on out to the equity indexes section. You'll find it about four slots down in the asset class section, then slip on over to the U.S. index. We'll be hanging out there in a second. But first, Tim, as I mentioned, you haven't joined us since December 9th. So it's been quite a while. It's been, I think, to put it mildly, a tumultuous start to the year. We already had some vol coming into the year. The equities were kind of precariously positioned from a pricing perspective. A lot of people thought maybe there was a little bit of overvaluation there. So we saw some sell-offs, of course. Saw a little bit of vol trickling in. Then, of course, Mr. Putin conspiring to drive up all the vol and drive down global markets in February. So a lot has happened in the world of equity and volatility since last we chatted. So let's start there. Catch us up. What have these last few months been like for you and the equities team over there at CME as things have been, to put it mildly, uh, pretty topsy-turvy, sir? Yeah, you know, certainly uh, some pretty volatile markets here in 2022. Uh, I think when we even look back to early January and February, we had, I think, the largest V-shaped intraday move in, in NASDAQ that we did since, uh, I think, 2008. And I think the largest in the Dow, right? I think going back almost to, uh, you know, early early 2000s, early in the NOC. Uh, and it, it's just been, it's been fascinating to watch in terms of the, the risk transfer that's happening, the volumes that are going through, the efficiencies of the market. Uh, it's certainly been... Uh, reinforcing of a theme that we've talked about before. We're at CME uh, and in, in the market more broadly that you know, index choice matters. You know, we're also seeing the different indices behave differently. Uh, you know, you have the Russell, the small cap, which is, is much more U.S. centric. You have the multinational corporations in the S&P and NASDAQ. Uh, but given the constituent weights of those two indices, they behave differently. Uh, and then every, you got the Dow. So it's lots of decisions for investors and traders out there. Uh, the indices are all moving, but they're not moving the same, which creates uh, plenty of trading opportunities. And and the market needs to hedge. You know, in these type of moves, you have a tremendous amount of option volume that is going through, and, and the market needs to constantly be hedging and rehedging and establishing those hedges in the market. Uh, and and it's really been interesting to watch as an exchange operator when when the markets behave like this for you know persistently over several weeks, almost the entirety of the quarter uh, so far. Uh, it it is reinforcing of we're we're here at for the the market when they need to manage their risk uh, and it's been it's been very interesting to watch uh, happy that everything's remained orderly at CME uh, with respect to the price discovery process and, and the risk transfer and you know I think you know we're going to see I don't think it's over yet right I think we're going to continue to see some choppiness in the markets here uh, you know futures are futures are up today which is, is nice to see some green on the board uh, for today, but it, it's going to certainly be an interesting time as as the macro, economic, and geopolitical landscape is continuing to to evolve uh, minute by minute these days. Yes, yeah, some green on the board today. Also, some red on the vol side of the screen. And of course, whenever we're talking equities, we have to set the table from a vol perspective. And coming into showtime, we had RVX, which is the VIX of the Russell 2000, right around 27 and a quarter. It puts it down about 3.7 handles from where it was this time last week. VIX was at about 22 and about a third when we kicked off the show, down almost exactly three points from where it was this time last week. So a lot of that premium in the market starting to erode these last few sessions of the markets have been on a an impressive tier ever since bouncing from uh, March 14th. Uh, VIX, which is the volatility of VIX itself, at about a 107. That's down about three quarters of a point. So still pretty frothy from that perspective. Vol Q, which is the at the money vol of the NASDAQ 100, we had the vol Q creator, Mr. Scott Nations, on our pro Q&A hot seat for all of our pro members over there on Tuesday. That was really fascinating, getting at some of the mechanics out there. So if you have questions about you know, how vol Q and NASDAQ vol should really relate to, let's say, S&P 500 vol or some of the other different vol metrics we talk about here, we had a great discussion about that just a few sessions ago. If you're in our pro membership, you can already check it out. If you're not, you should check it out, theoptionsinsider.com. Slash Pro is the place to go there. But Val Q coming into showtime 
at about a 24 and three quarters down about one and two thirds points from where it was this time last year. It puts that VIX to RBX. So that large cap to small cap ball spread right around five points, about 490. That's about three quarters of a point tighter than where it was this time last week. And VIX to ball Q. So the S&P to NASDAQ ball spread at right around two and a half points. It's actually about 1.3 points wider. That has widened out quite a bit. If you want, again, want to know where that stands from a historical perspective from those two indices, check out that Q&A we did earlier this week. Now let's head on into the equities listeners. Go to that drop down, go to US index. And we're going to hang out in the Russell 2000 first. That's a lot of a lot of people looking at small caps these days, seeing what's going on. We're still north of the 2000 level in small caps, even if they are net off about three quarters of a percent on the week at about a 2065 when we kicked off the show here. And once again, as most equities are wont to do, most of the action, about over a third is in the contract that's going out in one day. So we're going to go a little bit farther out, listeners. We're going to go all the way out to, let's see, let's go out to about the uh, April contract that has 21 days to go. That has done about 25% of the paper this week, so pretty active out there as well. What is the vol right now in this April contract in the Russell 2000, you may be asking? About a 24 exactly, off nearly two points on the week. Let's go out to uh, the skew side here. This puts last week, pretty bid, 14% bid this week. Even more bid, almost 16%, 15.9%. So puts ticking up a bit. The calls last week, 10.3% cheap. This week, 12.1% cheap. So calls cheaper, puts more expensive. That sounds like an equity to me. <laughs> In terms of the most action out here this week, it's kind of a bit of a toss-up. We have the 2080 calls doing a lot of paper and the contract going away tomorrow. They've been pretty active throughout the week. And those would certainly qualify as small delta calls now just because they have only one day to go. But outside of that, they had a little bit more meat on the bone, obviously. But also going out to what was trading in this April contract, let's go with the 19 half puts. So about a 115 point out of the money puts that were pretty active throughout the week as well, which is kind of fascinating. And you know what? <laughs> yeah, usually we see some farther. Usually they go out three to six months on these puts. Instead, they're doing it with about 21 days to go, which is kind of interesting. And not to be outdone, we also saw someone trading the September par one, aka 1,000 calls. <laughs> they went up a whopping 128 times this week in the Russell 2000. So yes, yeah, someone doing a little bit of a, shall we say, stock substitution. That's an intriguing choice, 1,000 points in the money. I'm not sure why you would go that far, but uh, c'est la vie. We have seen stranger things afoot out there. Now, Tim, we were talking earlier about all things equities, and you mentioned what's going on with the micros. Obviously, everyone's obsessed with the micro crypto right now, but the micros have been quite the success story in their own right in the equity landscape. In fact, that's really what kicked off this whole micro frenzy was these micro futures that you launched over there in the equity. So what's been going on in the world of all things bite-sized in the equity space, sir? Yeah, it's been certainly uh, continues to remain uh, a favorite of the market. Uh, it's hard to imagine that if we're coming up, you know, in May, they'll be around for three years. Seems like only yesterday uh, that we launched the micro e-minis at CME. Uh, and, and it's amazing. When we look at the uh, micro e-mini NASDAQ, this is something that I still find fascinating, that when we look at the their older siblings, the e-mini, it's really uh, the S&P e-mini is the lion's share of volume, uh, you know, it's, it's trading almost 2 million contracts a day here in, in 2022. But you look at NASDAQ and that's doing, oh, you know, 800, 700, 800,000 contracts per day. But you look at the micro e-mini and NASDAQ leads the pack. And I think that really speaks to how the active individual trader is is more a NASDAQ trader uh, base. They love to trade in the NASDAQ. It's the names they know. And since launch, the micro e mini NASDAQ has traded more than 523 million contracts, which is amazing. And here in 2022, trading 1.7 million contracts per day, which is up 80% versus last year, versus 2021. Uh, and then you look at the S&P, you know, they're, they're doing pretty well, too. Uh, the the micros are doing about 1.4, 1.5 million contracts uh, per day, which is up about 60% uh, versus last year. But I'm still just always fascinated that of the four micros that NASDAQ, NASDAQ is leading the pack. Uh, and we're seeing real good adoption with the micro e-mini uh, NASDAQ and S&P options that we have. You know, the, the S&P micro options are trading about 15,000 contracts a day. Uh, and we look at the micro NASDAQ options trading about 5,000 contracts a day. Uh, so really, really great stuff going on in micro. And, and not to be overshadowed by, their, by S&P and NASDAQ. Uh, Dow and Russell micro e-minis are also doing great with Dow 
uh, trading about 260, 270,000 contracts per day, up almost 100% versus last year. Uh, and you look at Russell 2000, doing about 210,000 contracts a day, up about 35% versus last year. Uh, so these are, I mean, continue to be a, a great tool of the market. Uh, and not just for retail, you know, everyone loves them. Uh, even some of the, the institutional clients love it, the smaller size, because they can precisely manage their risk in these type of markets. Uh, you know, down to the you know few thousand dollar risk increment versus trading the the, the older sibling E minis, which is a, a few hundred thousand. Uh, so th- it's been great. Uh, and Micromania is, is not just about equities anymore. You know, we have uh, 20 plus products uh, in micros now: uh, micro treasuries, micro crude, uh, micro FX, micro metals, micro E minis. So when we look at the totality of micros, we've now traded over 1.3 billion micro contracts at CME uh, and micro Bitcoin and Ether uh, options will be the, the the latest and greatest micro come Monday. So the great story going on all things micro here at CME. All right. Micromania. Did you come up with that yourself? I love that. that whatever, <laughs> whoever came up with that for you, Tim, I, they're doing yeah. my job for me. That's a great title for the episode. I, I'm going to get behind that fully micromania. Let's make that a hashtag. What do you say? Hashtag micromania. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. All right. I'm all aboard the micromania train. Looks like you folks have a lot of questions as well. So let's get to some of those now. A little bit of the old futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider radio network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com to some of your feedback. It's like, Tim, we got a lot of questions for you coming in our live chat. You certainly seems excited about the, uh, the micro Bitcoin options here, Tim. So you've certainly, you've certainly awakened right. our live listeners, which is good to see out there. All right, let's go on out first. Before we get some of the live, let's pay off some of the questions we asked you last week. We asked you a pretty contentious question. We said, if you had to buy one option, one option only on WTI, so a crude oil option that expires at the end of the year, which would you choose? The December 115 call or the one, excuse me, the 85 put when we posted that WTI was hovering right around 100. So it's pretty much equidistant to both. And that was reflected in the results. I've never seen a poll result like this in all the years that we've been doing this with our audience. Exactly split, exactly 50% each for the 115 call and the 85 put, which is A, fascinating. Never seen that before. And B, reflects that there is a little bit of ambiguity in that marketplace right now, which makes an interesting market. So, yeah, you folks are on both sides. I probably would have chosen the the 85 side, but, uh, you know, to each their own out there. That's certainly – it's hard to argue against the upside this week, that's for sure. Uh, a lot of people chimed in on this, like Sebastian. He would said, I would say the 115 call easily, but I would execute it in very late Q3 or early Q3. Uh, realistically, the demand will be less in Q4 and the world crude oil output will be on par. A lot of people pointed that out. The seasonality of crude is kind of interesting and probably plays a, a role in this. Ozzy made a similar comment. He said, I would like the AUG 85 put. So he's on the other side. He says, because crude oil goes down around the 4th of July week. So he's also playing it. But from the other side, because also of the seasonality again, which is kind of interesting. So a lot of uh, comments from you folks out there. But let's get to some of the questions we have now. Uh, Tim, from our live listeners about your micro offerings. Let's start with P&L Man. I know you just hit on this earlier, Tim. I think maybe P&L Man might have come in late to the chat. So he missed it, but I know you're not going to be mad to have a chance to repeat yourself on these because these products are going to be interesting for a lot of people. P&L Man wants to know, what choices do I have for duration of the micro Bitcoin options? He prefers short durations. As we were joking earlier, Tim, you got almost every day of the week now in the crypto space. So why don't we run it down really quickly again? For p l man, everyone else who might have missed it, what can I look at from an expiration perspective in the crypto offering, sir? Absolutely. The micro crypto options will have the nearest Monday and Wednesday options, and it will have the four nearest Friday expirations. So think in the month, it's going to be weeks one, two, three, and four for Fridays. You'll always have the next Monday and the next Wednesday 
maturity to trade and the two uh, month end, the Friday month end that lines up with the futures expiration. So plenty of choices uh, in the market. Uh, but again, the nearest Monday, Wednesday, four Fridays, and then the two month end Fridays for that line up with the futures. We got Nichols and Options Queen both in our chat saying both of them saying they're excited about the new micro Bitcoin option. So there you go, Tim. You got some converts here. <laughs> so you're going to have at least two contracts going up when you launch them on the 28th. That's right. So there you go. You're doing your duty for God and country out there. Uh, Frank, Frank has a little bit of a different question. He wants to know, can you take physical delivery of either Bitcoin or ETH at CME, Tim? What do you have to say for Frank? Yeah, so right now at CME, our products are financially settled. Uh, so the futures themselves settle against the Bitcoin reference rate and the Ether dollar reference rate. Uh, that's based on Bitcoin dollar fiat and e- Ether dollar fiat transactions from the five sisters exchanges, Bitstamp, Itfit, Gemini, Coinbase, and Kraken. Uh, but no physical uh, delivery of Bitcoin or ETH at CME. Uh, and, we, and we don't accept it as, as collateral or anything like that. So, so just a financially settled option works the same way in your account that an E-mini S&P would. Uh, just moving the dollars. That's an interesting question, actually, Tim. I'd like to get your thoughts on that for a second, just because we saw a lot of people try to launch in the last few years with a lot of fanfare, the physically settled, physically delivered contracts in crypto. It seemed like there was a lot of interest in them early on because they certainly got a lot of headlines. And then when they materialized, they ended up doing a whole whopping heck of a lot of nothing. It seems like no one really was that interested in it. In fact, we've had some venues on recently that offered some of those physically uh, delivered contracts, and they ended up seem like there's, they're kind of pivoting away from that now. So I'm kind of curious for you as as the crypto product guy over there at CME, do you think there is a lot of institutional demand for a physically delivered or settled contract? Or was that maybe maybe a lot of headlines, but not a lot of actual demand when you actually list the product? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, in, in our minds here at CME, we never, we never kind of see it as an either or choice. Uh, I think there is a need for physically settled products in the market. Uh, I think just when you look at the operational challenges that, that some firms face or individuals face in terms of custodying, operating a wallet, uh, you know, shorting, uh, this, you know, if you're on the short side of the market, you got to get secure borrow and stuff like that, which can be expensive. Uh, and cumbersome. So I think there's just some operational and logistical challenges that still make it uh, difficult for some folks. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's an either or. We went with uh, financially settled because that's what we're hearing from customers at the time. It's also easier for us to bring that to market because we didn't have to uh, handle, you know, back in 2017, the custody solution was even more elusive than it is uh, today for some folks. Uh, so, so we'll see. Uh, I think the one thing, though, is that when we look at the physical solution, the way that the the market has developed, I think uh, the market is still figuring out what custody and storage means for itself. Uh, and I think that needs to be a, a bit more cemented in the marketplace. And there has to be flexibility in any type of offering that people could move between custodians and, and move these tokens around. There were still early days, I think, in some of that, the, you know, from a, let's go from more of the institutional and the clearing member perspective. So those, those are a lot of things they still, still need to work on. Uh, time will tell. So maybe one day we'll have we'll have the physical contract uh, that will be successful. Uh, but but you know that, I think right now financially is just a lot easier for folks and it makes and you get the same price exposure, which is great. Yeah, I kind of thought there would be a bit of a, a hit, and it turned out to uh, not really be much one one at all. So that's kind of surprised me. It certainly seemed like there might be a use case there. Certainly, the covered call makes sense, and maybe sell a put to get into some Bitcoin or ETH. But it didn't seem like that really resonated with the audience, which kind of surprised me. Speaking of the audience, we got some more coming at you here, Tim. Let's go back out to the live. Nichols says uh, he wants to know. Tim, he likes. He's excited about the micro Bitcoin and micro ETH, and he wants to know: Are there any other crypto that interests Tim right now, sir? So I know you'd. You don't like to open the kimono too much, but you can maybe say, broadly speaking, are there any other maybe altcoin that are on the radar right now? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin and Ether are certainly keeping us busy uh, right now. That's where our focus is. Uh, one of the things that we are, we're, we are looking at and we're always engaging with customers is keep in mind, we also have the, the reference rate products with our partner, CF Benchmark. Uh, so I'd say, you know, we're probably likely to, to look at some additional reference rates, um, you know, so, so stay tuned on that front. But on the product side, the tradable product side, uh, Bitcoin and ETH is, is keeping us plenty busy right now. So what I'm hearing, Tim, if I read between the lines there, is look for Avalanche futures coming soon. 
from CME. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, you didn't hear me say that. You know, but <laughs> just reading between the lines. Just two guys talking. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> I got. I, I got to keep it close. Close to the vest so I can get booked to get on the show. I can't give too much. Too much. That's away true. Right you got to. You got to save some cards for your next <laughs> visit out there. Well, before we wrap things up, Tim, I, I want to get you to play along in this one. We have another question of the week going on right now. It's kind of up your alley, Tim. You're the king of all things small over there at CME right now. Uh, we asked our audience this week, a lot of people, or I should say not a lot, some people refuse to trade options on quote-unquote cheap stocks or cheap underlines. Are you in that camp or will you trade options on anything? Quite simply, what is your cutoff point where the stock becomes too cheap to trade the options? We gave you a bunch of choices. Is it below $15? Is it below $10? Is it below $5? Or are you? do you have no limits because you're just a savage out there? Tim, I'm curious for you, if you have a, a personal cutoff that you think, you know, maybe if a stock or an underlying gets below 10 bucks, you don't trade options anymore. You think the underlying becomes more of an option or I should say, and then more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for, Tim? So a twofer for you. Oh, it's a good question. You know, per, personally, I think, you know, and before, I, you know, I was at the exchange as an equity trader. Uh, I think at a certain point, kind of below the ten dollars threshold, you know, to your point, Mark, it's like the the stock itself is almost cheap enough to be an option. Um, you know, but trading options are fun, so I think as long as it moves around, uh, you know, I, I might I might personally look at below the the ten handle uh, as long as they're fun to to, to trade and, and keep things exciting. Uh, but knowing your your crowd, hmm, my guess is I think they'll trade anything. You know, I feel like everyone, you know, options enthusiasts. <laughs> You're saying they're a bunch of savages, with the Tim. Yeah. Insider. <laughs> you know, the words, not mine. I just think that, I think they'll trade anything. We actually do say that in the poll. We say no limits. You're a savage, and so that was the question. <laughs> and you are correct. You know our audience, Tim, because forty percent of them saying they have no limits. They're a bunch of savages out there. If they see an option they like, they will trade it, regardless of the price. Of the I was with you. I thought ten dollars would be kind of a good line of demarcation, Tim, but apparently I'm alone because then right yeah. behind it was 28% for fifth, below $15, which seems kind of high to me, and then 24% for below $5, and only 8% said 10 bucks, Tim. So that surprises me a little bit. But the savagery does, I don't, doesn't surprise me. I know we have a lot of savages out there, but uh, below 15 bucks, that seems, I question that. I think you'll trade options. Uh, nonetheless, get out there at options. The clock is ticking, listeners. You have less than a day to play along in our question of the week. All right, everybody. That music means we come to the end of another epic journey through the world of futures options. We touched on a lot of, what did Tim call it? Micromania <laughs> this week. <laughs> I like that, Tim. I will be borrowing that, just letting you know now. So hopefully your licensing rates are pretty reasonable over there <laughs> at CME. I'm going to be doing a lot of Micromania coming soon. But Mr. Tim, you touched on that, touched on all the micro stuff. You also hit on... A little bit earlier, some of these, uh, I don't know, event products you have coming up. Maybe leave, leave us with the tease of those, sir. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's super exciting. Uh, we're introducing event-based contracts. They're going to make it easier for everyone out there to trade their view on daily up-down price movements in some of the world's most trusted benchmarks that we have at CME. Uh, you know, these event contracts coming in Q3 are going to be contracts that include oil, gold, the four major equity index products and some foreign currency. Uh, they're really excited. They're, they're fully collateralized, providing investors a simple, low cost and easy to use product to, to trade everyday markets with limited risk. Uh, so I'm really excited about it. And, and you know, stay tuned for more details. Uh, but Q3, we're targeting and, we'll, you know, we'll share the launch date uh, when we have everything done and dust on our end. That could be huge. A lot of people have been waiting for a big player to get into the event space. So, Tim, you could be kicking off. Is that going to be under your purview as well? Are you going to be crypto equities and events guy now? <laughs> you got my biggest. Well, you know, four, <laughs> you know, four, four of them are equities. And, uh, yeah. You know, wow. Too. So, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll how do you keep goes, getting all the cool stuff at CME, Tim? What did you do over there? I don't understand. But, hey, it works out pretty yeah. well. <laughs> you have a guaranteed recurring seat on the show now. So I'm looking That's forward cool. to those. Q3, you said? That's right, Q3. Check them out, Q3. And, of course, coming up in just a few days now on the 28th, you guys can get your fill of 
Hashtag Micromania with the micro Bitcoin and micro Ether options. How long have we been bugging Tim for these options? Now, here they are. He's finally delivering for us out there. Pretty quick on the Ether side, only since December 6th for those. So check those out. And, of course, you know where to go to check out all these reports we talk about throughout the show, throughout the week. It's seemegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O, or slash twifo. Both of those should work. If you want to check what's going on in heating oil options at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, we won't judge. Head on over. Seemegroup.com slash twifo. Those reports are live all week long, not just during showtime, listeners. And, of course, you know where to go to learn more about all things small caps. It's footsie Russell, F-T-S-E, Russell. Dot com, all of that one word there. Follow him, give him a follow on the old Twitters as well at FTSE Russell. Again, all one word. You can find all sorts of great data, small cap sources, large caps, volatility, COVID impact, recon coming up. In fact, I may have a bit of a interesting working theory I have to put to those FTSE Russell folks about how that June 8th date, we, we talked about many times on some of our other shows the last couple of years. Seems like it's the apex for the year for a lot of smaller names out there. Maybe it has something to do with recon. Perhaps we'll find out. FTSERussell.com is the place to go to learn more. We have to get on out of here, but we'll be back again tomorrow, listeners. Noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, breaking down the mad world of volatility. (laughs) Yeah, it's a fun one. So join us for Volatility Views tomorrow. And after that, for all of you pro members, coming up 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, exclusively for you. We break down the week that was in the world of unusual activity with options oddities did i get filled on those vrm puts i guess we'll find out on tomorrow's show and then of course back again next week all the way through to another thursday another episode of this week in futures options stay safe out there everybody this week in futures options is brought to you by cme group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.